Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeph from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I'm with Nick Westerman of Hewn and Hone. Nick, how are you doing? Oh, very well, and yourself? I'm doing very well, thank you. So I'm visiting Nick at his workshop here in the middle of Wales. Now if you're unfamiliar with Nick, Nick is a professional full-time tool maker, uh, renowned for all the tools he makes, more so for the green woodworking space. Now what this video is going to do is kicking off a multi-part series where we're going to be looking at a turning sloyd knife now if you're not familiar with what that is don't worry we will be looking at an example in the moment now in this first video what we're going to be looking at is the first aspect of that process we're going to be looking at the forging annealing and rough shaping now, that's what we're going to look at in this video and then in the preceding videos we're going to look at the rest of the components of this series and we're going to end up literally with a completely finished knife starting off with a raw piece of steel now a couple of things to mention before we get on with the meat and bones of this video all the components of this series are going to be linked below in the description highly recommend you go check that out also anything that we reference throughout this video in terms of components and whatnot will also link to below where you can actually source those and finally what we've done is we've broken this video down into different chapters to help facilitate you watching and uses as a reference video also the links will be down below to the different sections of this video on the left hand side you will see all the different timestamps YouTube is a very cool feature where if you click on those times the video will jump straight to that particular section so as you move forward and you want to reference a specific section of this video rather than manually skimming through you can just click on that link below and it will jump straight to that particular section so like I said in this first video we're going to be looking at the forging and then we're going to be looking at the annealing and then the rough shaping but first what we're going to do we're going to look at an example of the knife the turning knife slide so you can understand exactly what that is and then we're going to get on straight with the actual forging process so without further ado I hope you enjoy the rest of this video So Nick, so to begin the series and this particular video, I think it's important to discuss what is a turning sloyd knife? Uh, well, <clears throat> this is what I would be uh, calling a turning sloyd. Uh, it's something which I developed, uh, I suppose alongside with Dave Cockcroft, I actually make blanks and he grinds a very similar blade, very, very closely related, but this is my take on it. And the idea is it's, it's a much smaller version of a sloyd knife these are two other examples perhaps that's more common to a 106 uh, but the main thing is not necessarily the length or the size of it but the actual width of the bevel you can see the actual cutting bevel is very narrow compared to this one and the point of that is that uh, with a sloyd knife i mean i'm not knocking a sloyd knife that's your main go-to knife uh, if you're doing a long planing cut the bevel engages and it allow you to take a long smooth flat cut and yes you can do that with the turning sloyd but the actual length of bevel you've got to engage isn't as long so it's not going to be quite as good for a planing cut but what it will do is you can come round into tight uh, tight inside curves and it will go round a cut and it will turn round smoothly and it will turn in the cut because the bevel isn't going to lever it out. So if we use a, a long beveled knife and we cut in it will tend to drag and then cut out. It's not going to cut smoothly because the length of the bevel if you look at it like this can't turn round that radius you see you're getting a it can't engage smoothly uh, whereas we look at it like this a short bevel will turn round and cut round. So it allows you to make cuts that you can't do with a slide knife and it will turn in a cut. That's the idea, that's why I've called it a turn. Dave calls it something else, obviously. Uh, I call it a turning slide because it will turn in a cut. It's nothing to do with turning, wood turning. So that, that's the main thing. Uh, there's geometry involved, but we'll actually talk about a little bit more about how we arrive at the short bevel when I do the grinding, because that's, that's what the grinding uh, episode is about really. But uh, it's to do with the short bevel. That's what makes it a turning slide. So Nick, to start off with the entire process, we're going to be looking at the steel. So where would you like to actually begin? Uh, well, the steel is the best starting point. Um, this is quarter inch round bearing steel and it's a steel I've used a lot. It's, it's one of my favourite steels really. It's, it's hard to, quite a hard steel to forge, but it gives a very good 
uh, very good edge and it's, uh, it's known by lots of different names, uh, L3, uh, in sort of the old English designation it was the N31, uh, 52100 in American, um, but it's known as bearing steel because generally it's the steel which is used for bearings and it will give a hard resilient edge. So that's what we're going to start with. Uh, I buy it in long lengths and I'm going to cut it into, cut it into the precise length I need uh, for the turning slide blanks I'm going to make, which I'll do in the bandsaw. It's the steel I buy which is annealed, so it will cut without damaging the blade. If it was hardened I'd have to use an angle grinder or something. But, uh, It's right, I should have put a finer tooth saw blade on so it tends to catch on the last tooth as it goes through. And I'll do 10 because it's never worth doing one or two of anything. We'll do nine. <laughs> so what length are you cutting these to? <clears throat> they are to 10.5 centimetres, which I know gives me, uh, there's enough steel to forge out and the tang's the right length without wasting lots of steel in a, uh, in a tang, which I don't need, because these are quite um, fragile blades, I suppose, or subtle blades. So you don't need a huge, great tang in there to support lots of power strokes or you're not going to be battening on it like a wood, you know, like a uh, bushcraft blade. So you can get away with a pretty short tang, but it looks a bit, a bit odd if you go too short. So uh, I've settled on 10.5 for these. So now moving on to the forging process itself, would you like to talk a little bit about, about the forge? Yes, yeah. I mean, this is a forge which you can see has had a lot of use. I use it for fairly big batches of tools, which is why it's a lot larger than, I mean, it's not huge, but it's large enough I can fit. I could, if I wanted, I could fit all 10, I could fit 20 blanks in at once. Uh, I won't actually do it like that. I'll cycle three or four at once, but uh, it allows me to run multiples in. Um, it's a forge which is actually, it's not as big as it looks because it's got three inches of insulation so it's pretty well insulated so the heat is, um, is, uh, is not lost too much but obviously it all spills out but the better the insulation the more even the heat throughout the forge. It's, um, it, I suppose you could put a normal style um, um, Venturi style burner in there, but I've always used uh, this style, which I made up a long time ago, which is just a simple gas tube going in here with a, a butterfly valve here to control the uh, gas flow. And then I've got a fan, which is here, which controls the airflow. So they run completely independently of each other and you can get the mixture completely wrong if you want. But the idea is, is I, the, the amount of airflow controls the heat that I want and then I just balance a mixture on this um, with the gas flow. And that allows a lot of flexibility so I can run a very small flame or a very large flame up to a welding heat if I want to do that. Um, and yeah, this is a very good, um, uh, well for me, it's a forge which I like a lot. It's lasted a long time. And, and so for those at home that are watching, what is your advice to them in terms of a forge setup? Uh, well, it wouldn't be this because it's not that easy. I mean, I'm using it. If, you, if you're doing production stuff, then yes. But if you're at home and you're doing something, um, something like the two and a half brick forge, which we're going to talk about, would, would be fine for singles and doubles or triples of blades, uh, which is... Uh, 
a similar sort of version. It's a well insulated box with a gas flame going in and that's all you need for a forge really. Uh, it doesn't need to be anything more complicated or you could it just use a, uh, not just because it's just as good, uh, you could use charcoal. Uh, charcoal outside is, charcoal is a wonderful um, medium to work in uh, for small volumes of tools so you don't even have to use gas. So, but yeah, this isn't the choice for uh, you know, someone at home. So the two and a half brick forge is something we have covered in the previous video, where you've shown mm. people how to make one and obviously some basic advice and tips on using mm. it. Um, so that video will be linked below in the description. So with the forge in itself, where would you actually like to begin? Uh, well, we'll let, I'll light the forge. <clears throat> we'll let it get up to heat because uh, all these, these blanks which are cut are forged quickly in a single heat because I want to limit the amount of scaling. So they're going to have to get very hot and it will do that quite quickly because the longer it takes the more scale it will burn, you know, um, scale will be produced. All this, all this is scale, all this is bearing steel which is, oh, it's not falling away but yes, that's all lost steel so you don't want to limit scaling. So we'll light it uh, and then we're going to wait 10-15 minutes for it to come up to heat uh, and I'll show you the forging process. So to light it <coughs> First thing I do is a little bit more gas. And I just let that sit for 10, 15 minutes to come up to heat. Uh, I can adjust the flame, but from the sound of that, that's about right for now. So. Uh, but yeah, it's just a little bit of red coming in, but it'll take a while. So Nick, how are we looking with the forge? Is that at the right temperature you feel? Yeah, we're looking at a yellow there, which is what we need. If it looks orange, it's not going, I'm not going to get through the whole thing in one heat, and I want to do these start to finish in a single heat. What I'll do now is, because it's important uh, to limit the amount of scale, is I'm going to put, put a blank in, like that, and then I will leave that about 45 seconds because that's how long it takes me to forge, forge these blanks out. And then 45 seconds later, I'll put in the next one. 45 seconds after that, I'll put in the next one. And by then, the first one should be up to heat and I should be able to just keep cycling in, taking a hot one out, putting a cold one in. I mean, everything will have the same amount of time in the forge, so the same amount of scale, but it does rely on me forging in a single heat and getting it done in about 45 seconds. But in practice, it meshes in quite well. It's much better to, oh, and it's time to put the second one in, I would say. Well, the, yeah, I'll get the third one ready. So this works much better than putting 10 in at once and then all 10 come up to heat. You take one out at the right time, which is fine. But then the problem is after that, that the second one will have been in longer than the third one. And by the time you get to the 10th one, that will have been at heat 10 times as long as the first one. So that will have more scale on it. So it won't be the same blade as the first one. But I've taught long enough and I can put the third one in now. At this point, the first one is up to heat, so I'm going to start the power hammer. And start the process. So I've got one up to heat. I'll, I'm going to put another one in, take out the hot one, and then I'll just mesh into that cycle. hammer mark there but it will come out in the uh, bevel grind and that's it so 
There'll be a hot one waiting, so I'll put a cold one in. Grab the hot one and carry on with the cycle. Same again. There's no new one to put in.
one, yeah? Last one, yeah. So now I've done all nine, uh, the next stage is going to be to soften the steel so it's going to be hard enough, or soft enough, that I can crop it with uh, shears because that's a much nicer way to do the final shaping. So what I'll do is I'll just turn the forge off, <coughs> let it cool a little bit, uh, and then I'll shut the forge, well I'll put the blanks in. Uh, let them come up to a red heat and then cool down slowly and that's the first part of heat treatment is it's going to be annealing the steel uh, because the steel's gone from being having a nice structure where it was soft enough to um, uh, to saw to uh, it's been heated up very rapidly to a high temperature and worked hard and the grain size the grain structure will be very coarse and it won't make a very strong blade and if I let this just cool now and try to shear it it would actually chip it will air harden enough but it would chip and it really won't work well, well it won't work you can't actually shape it so I've got to let it cool slowly which will soften it but it'll also start repairing the grain damage which has occurred by the forging process uh, still too hot, I'm running out of things to say. No uh, worries. Uh, Actually, one thing, I, I have got a question for yeah. you. So obviously okay. you've got a power hammer yeah. with what you were kind of doing the forging with. So for those at home that will use whatever anvil they've got to hand, yeah. uh, be it a piece of railway track or whatever that they've mm. got, um, would they then assume that they will just use the hammer um, and their anvil to then do most of that shaping? Is that what would happen? Yes, yes the difficulty is, getting there <clears throat> it's because with the power hammer is your two faces come down in line so you get a neat shoulder on either side if you're hammering you have to be pretty accurate to get the two the hammer the edge of the anvil and the edge of the hammer to line up there's other tools which people use to do that offset uh, but it doesn't really matter you, know, you don't have to have such a sharp offset as this uh, but yeah, it's the same idea as you'd hammer here, but you'd have to be hammering quite accurately if you wanted to get a really even, to get this, this step down to be even. But it's the same process. But we're now at the temperature that I can bung these in. Oh, that's not bad, is it? <clears throat> That's what the ball's for. Check, yeah, they're all even enough. <clears throat> Still perhaps a little bit hot, so what I'd normally do is if it was a bit colder, I'd like close the door on the thing, but I'll leave it open a bit to let it cool a bit more. And then I'll just uh, put this brick in, which holds the heat in, and it will come down slowly, but I don't want it to get too hot, but yeah. And how long does this process typically take? Normally, I will forge towards the end of the day, or I'll find, normally I'll find something else to do, so I'll forge, uh, and in winter that's great because it will bring the heat up in the workshop, um, and I'll generally come in the next day and take these out, and if I've been forging late at night, well, in the evening at least, uh, they'll actually still be slightly warm to the touch, they'll cool down that slowly, and the longer and slower the kneel the better, but yeah, but like even even if we can do a couple of hours, that will be soft enough. It's not going to chip the um, chip the shears. But I'll just put this in. I mean, you can see it's nowhere close to a perfect fit, but that just it will cool down much slower, and that will anneal it enough, and it's all right to uh, to do the next process, which will be uh, doing a rough profiling of the blade. So yeah, we'll just have to wait now. So Nick, has the annealing process been completed? Yes, yes, these were left overnight in the forge with 
next day now we've taken them out and uh, they're ready to go. They've been softened nicely so I'll be able to cut these in this uh, old pair of shears uh, which is just a much easier and nicer process than grinding uh, so I'll be showing you that. This is a pair of shears which uh, I didn't make but I've replaced so many bits there's not much left of it which uh, is, is original. It was a homemade thing and uh, I've repaired it got broken by a friend who tried to use it, so this has snapped off and been put back on. I replaced that shear blade and then this shear blade, and I've replaced all the bolts snap periodically and I put a new handle on it. So there's very, very little of it left original, but it's, um, for this, it's a brilliant thing. Um, and this you've clamped into your, your table vise? It just cl clamps into the vise, yes. Uh, and it will handle up to about three and a half millimeter steel just if you're careful with it. Uh, it needs a bit of care to use, but for this is now down to one and a half, two millimeter thick, and a annealed tool steel is just as soft, soft as mild steel, so it's very easy to cut. If I hadn't annealed it though, uh, and I'd just used it straight after forging and let it air cool, it would have air hardened enough that this would shatter, it would actually chip into pieces and it would take chunks out of the edge of the shear blade, which is actually, these are made of uh, bearing steel now, so it's the same material, it's just been heat treated so it will cut um, the same steel with a different state of heat treat. So, so. With the kind of design that you're going to be uh, doing the rough shaping on, um, is that something you've scribed on there or? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to <coughs> diverge slightly. I sell blanks like this on the website um, for people to grind their own blade from. So what I'll do is I'll very, I mean, I could just sell it as a, as a heat treated blank uh, like this, but then there'd be a huge amount to take off. So what I'll do is I'll rough shape it, but I'm not going to take much off because then I'm allowing whoever buys it to, you know, impose their own blade. I'm not like, dictating exactly what shape it would be. So I'm going to demonstrate shearing a few where I'm just, just cleaning it up, but I'm allowing, I'll even allow enough straight edge. If someone wanted to do a sloid blade or a blade, which had got a straight edge, they could, they could have a straight edge and a curved spine, or they could do more what I'd expect would be a curved edge and a straight spine. So I'm going to leave quite a lot on. Whereas <coughs> these two here, I've actually scribed on the shape of the, uh, the sloid, turning sloids I normally make and rather than, it seems pointless uh, making an oversized one and then grinding it down just for the sake of the video. So I'm going to shear, uh, shear this more accurately and I'll show you how I can just about split that line with the shear so I can cut really accurately so there'll be less grinding in the next stage but I'll show both versions of it because you wouldn't be buying them like this. If you're buying a blank from me, it will be in a more roughed out shape. So you've got a bit more, uh, there's a bit more for you to do. You can decide what you want to do. So just to kind of recap then, so you saw this knife in different stages. So the first stage is you do the rough shaping like you're going to do now, but you leave a buffer. Um, then in the second video, we're going to be doing a heat treat. And it's at that stage you sell the first stage of the knife. Is yes, that correct? the first stage, yes, the first stage, first blank is still sold heat treated. So it's at the point where it's going to behave like a knife. Uh, so you can grind it. You don't have to do any heat treat yourself. That's already been done. It means you've got to be a bit careful when you're doing the grinding so you don't overheat it and damage the temper. But it is effectively a, an unsharpened knife at the stage I sell it. You've just got to do the shaping so the heat treat will be done, yes, at that stage. And specifically for this video that we're doing now in this series, what you're going to do, you're now going to do the rough cutting and shaping, but it's going to be a lot closer to the actual final shape. Yes, yes, for, yes, for, for in this series, yes. Just because it's going to be, it'll make the grinding uh, sequences quicker rather than me grinding lots of metal off, which I don't need to, because this is quite a fun process. It's quite quick and it's, there's no electricity involved. There's no dust. It's a much nicer way to work. Whereas grinding isn't, yeah, I think you should limit that as much as possible. So we're not going to be doing any more grinding than we have to in the video. So Nick, you're going to begin the rough shaping then? Yes, yeah, this will be the, the rough shaping one. It's because there's quite a lot of force when you, when you clip, it tends to want to jump up and at that stage it puts a lot of strain on the jaws, which is why this got snapped by a friend who didn't know what he was doing. So I will always, if I'm 
If I was cutting like this, I've got enough leverage that I can shear it off and just with my finger I can resist it, so that's all right. But there's not enough strength leverage this way, so if I hold it in some vice grips, I can then shear here. Most of it, it's like with any pivot, you've got more leeway, you know, more mechanical advantage near the pivot, so I'll start off as close as I can and I'm just going to shear a straight line here towards the spine. And I still do most of the cut, I keep moving it in. And you can see that it's shearing away like that. And I'll just nip it off. And then I'll do, so just some rough shaping here. I don't want to take too much off because it allows leeway for whoever's buying the blank. Something like that. And it will have distorted um, because it's been sheared, but we'll be hammering that straight and we can do that cold. So I'll just do one more at speed because I don't generally do stuff slowly. And another one, so it's a very quick process. Now just to show that it can be more accurate, these are the ones which have been marked out. And <clears throat> these have actually got a hollow, slightly hollowed spine. And I can only, I can cut convex, but I can't cut concave of this. So all I can do is go straight across the top of the spine. downside is is that you mark onto the scale and then the scale cracks off to some extent when you, uh, when you, when you shear. But I'll start on here. But I can cut a convex. See, you can come around like that and I've pretty much followed the... a little bit long but I'll do one more. So you can get quite accurate with your shares, can't you? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> the difficulty is seeing the, the line just tends to disappear if I was scratched a bit deeper. But yeah, the shears will. And then you really are limiting the amount of grinding you have to do, which if you've got a stack of 40 of these to do, it's much nicer to shear like this, because I haven't got to wear uh, you know, eye protection and lung protection, ear protection, and uh, there's no noise and the waste is, although to be fair, the waste is not very nice. You get these sharp little shards which have to be quite careful. They're not nice. They can go straight through you for a boot. So uh, I do have to clean those up. But compared to dust, um, this is a much nicer way of shaping. So that's rough shaping done. The next stage is to, um, is to, they do, they do get distorted, so, but because it's been annealed, it's perfectly all right to straighten these cold. So the next stage, we'll take it to the anvil and just tap these straight. So I think what's next in the process? Uh, next in the process is taking out this warp from the, um, from the cropping. So I'm just going to do that on the anvil. These are cold, they're soft, so you can actually do it. Uh, <clears throat> I find it easier to use a light hammer moving quickly for this. And the general idea of straightening is you don't, uh, if you've got a bend, you don't try and hit the, uh, the, the, the bent bit which is pointing up because you just get a rocking action. I always talk about putting the hump up on the anvil and flattening down to it. So I wouldn't be going this way, I'd be going, going that way. And then sometimes the shearing action, if I get too close to the, um, if I'm shearing too close to the spine, it can offset the spine a bit and I need to hit quite accurately in here. But to start off with, I'll just take this obvious bend out. And it's just, if you, if you carry on hitting, it will straighten and then over straighten. It will, but it's just a few light gentle taps with a bit of downwards pressure. So I'm pressing down here. That's straight enough. Again, hump up.
And there's a little bit of a bend hump up here. These have got an S bend in, so there's one going this way and one going there. And this has got a little bit, it's hard to say if it's an optical illusion from the, where the, there's a bit of a tag from it, but I'm gonna try and knock that down a little bit more. I have to be quite accurate if I don't hit this, uh, you know, the actual round tang here and mar it. Will do. I think that most of this is just a burr from the cropping, which is going to be ground out. That one's all right. That's it. And it doesn't really matter because it's going to be um, uh, after grinding. I'll be checking for straightness again, but it's difficult to grind because uh, I'll do a tiny bit of grinding. Uh, on this and it's no fun trying to grind a banana because you don't get an idea what's straight. So I'm going to do the tiniest bit of grinding at this point just in case I've got any, when I cut, you know like when kids cut with scissors like uh, paper you get these like jagged edges, uh, they're really nasty and steel if you get that. There's one here where I've done a, there's a little tag here which will, you see my finger will catch on that horrendously so I just want to just run over it with a grinder and buzz those off so that's the next stage okay so we're at the grinder this is a big three phase one uh, but that's what I use so I'll show you on this uh, there's a couple of grinds I'm going to do the first one is just where it's been cut off uh, there's a little burr here and because it's going to be inserted into a handle it's nice to put a radius on here but it's, it's a very small radius so the first thing is going to be to grind the radius on all of them <coughs> and then the next thing I'll do uh, is just to just run across here and make sure I've got rid of any tags which would be really unpleasant to, to sell like that but I'm not going to do any real shaping because the whole point is uh, that's going to be done after heat treat So I think just before we wrap up, you wanted to show kind of where we progressed in this video. Yes, yeah, it's like when I'm teaching, I always like to show students like what the progression is. And so we started from this, uh, just plain bar, and you can still obviously see the parent material in the tang, but we've forged it out and uh, yeah, we've got a rough shape to it. It's starting to look like a blade. And I think that's what I like about forging is it looks like it's grown. If you're, if you're working with, um, flat steel all you can do is remove if you're not forging all you can do is remove it whereas here it hasn't got bigger but it, it looks like you've actually got more than you started with which is uh, why I love forging. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Um, so just a kind of reminder, this video is part one of a multi-part series where we're going from a natural raw piece of steel all the way to a completely finished turning slide knife. Now, all the other components of this series will be listed below in the description. In the part two, what we're going to be looking at is the heat tree. So Nick is going to dive deep into that and show you his entire process for that. So if you want to go check that out, which I highly recommend you do, once again, links to that will be down below. And a reminder of a couple of things, we've broken this video out into top 
timestamps. So obviously, as you move forward, you can use this as a reference material. You can scroll along the actual timeline of this video on YouTube, or alternatively, all the timestamps are down below in the description. On the left-hand side are the times. YouTube has a very cool feature. If you click on the times, it would jump straight to that section rather than you having to manually scroll through. The other thing I'm going to do is put a link to Hewn and Home down below with all the different kind of things that have been referenced throughout this entire series and this video, where you can go and you can source those components for yourself. And the hope is with this video and those components that are being sold on Hewn and Home, that you can obviously take those two together and go ahead and make your own knife. And the final thing that I'm gonna do is gonna put a link below to the Hewn and Hone Instagram, and it will mean the world to me that if you gain any value from this video whatsoever, to go to Hewn and Hone, give Nick a follow over there, and to see the work that they're doing on Hewn and Hone. Nick, like I said, is doing this full time, so there's a lot of cool innovations that are happening on Hewn and Hone, and you can be kept up to date both through the website and the Instagram profile. So Nick, sincere thank you once again. Well, thank you, yeah. Um, I've really enjoyed watching this process uh, myself and to see from start to finish in this particular section. And I'm also looking forward to now forming part two. Um, yeah. and looking at the heat tree. So guys, we really do appreciate you watching all the way up until the end if you have done so already. And like I said, links to all the other videos in this series down below. So I shall see you on the next video. And until then, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed week, a blessed day. And from Nick Westerman and myself, Zed Outdoors, peace out.